This is part of the Post Qualitative Research Collective, which was in itself a project that was uh, funded by the National Research Foundation of South Africa, which came to an end um, at the end of last year, but is still, um, well, still gaining momentum. So we just keep on going. And um, and as you can see also with the, the book series, more and more are published and are in the pipeline. Line. Uh, there's another three or four I think this year and next year as well that are coming and the exciting thing about this book series is that it also has got a kind of transmodal uh, dimension to it so that when there are images or films as for example we had with was it chapter two in this book series where during the reading group it became clear how important the film was to go with the uh, with the reading and so that's now also on uh, on the website so the whole idea of it is also to to support people who are either writers or lecturers or just interested in post qualitative research to to think about what might these resources be that are, are very supportive and helpful we are focusing uh, on uh, one book or sometimes just or not just but sometimes a scholarly work of one of the members of the collective and then we read their work and then we have a panel at the end of that and then we have these what we call returning so return to scholarship return to books um, as a way of really celebrating the work we do and keep inquiring in that together so that's also why I'm the difficultator rather than the facilitator of this, the whole idea that education is about um, transmitting something that is very easy for the lecturer to something that might be really confusing and for um, obstruse for the for the student. And then there's that kind of transition transmission model is disrupted. And the idea is that all of us are partners in um, in having inquiries together about those questions that keep keep um, yeah keep being opened up through the the difficulty of the subject matter itself. So because of the concepts that we work with, they themselves keep generating more and more questions. So also what we're doing here and in the reading group, it's not necessarily that what the idea is, is that we um, come to a quick answer to any of those questions, but that we, oh, thank you, but that we continue um, seeing how we can meet questions with further questions. So if at the end of this 90 minutes, minus a few minutes, uh, still feel that you have lots of lots of questions left, Perfect. You know, that's the true sign that we've been doing some some really good philosophical work. So I won't say any more other than introduce um, our panel members. But before I do that, if everyone in the room could introduce themselves briefly in the chat. So if you can just say a little bit about yourself, apart from the panel members, and then we open up so we can read your chat and who you are. So just say a little bit maybe about your geopolitical location, where you are um, meeting us and anything you want to say, really. Um, and then we can read that. And then we introduce the panel members and we've got a series of questions that we've been collected and George will be uh, sharing that with us uh, later on after we've gone through the chat introductions. Mm -hmm. 
I think people writing, I okay, guess, Sophia. Hi, Sophia. It's lovely to have such a big crowd of people. Wow, yeah. I'm room today. I'm from all over the world. <laughs> I'm in Boston. <laughs> okay. Keep keep those going. Um and in the meantime, I suggest that we uh yeah, you can keep reading as well. Maybe people if they can start Let's have a look at our um, panel members. Um, maybe we could start. We've got the three editors of the book here. And we've got the panel. Where is ah Dylan? Maybe Dylan, you could start us off. And then if you can see another panel member in the group, if you can then uh, hand over to that person. Can you hear me? Yeah. But I think you're frozen now. Which is interesting in the context of hydro feminism. <laughs> oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Uh. Oh, sorry. Uh, and uh, my system seems to be frozen here. But um, I am a theatre maker and storyteller, and um, I'm very and a and a, a recent. Um, I've been recently um, invited in the last few years into the hydro feminist space, and it's my most exciting space so far. So um, yeah, lovely to be here. And Are you I think she is. Yeah. Can I hand over to her? To who? Sorry. To Joanne. Joanne is not a panelist. She's an author oh. of the book. <laughs> um, but we haven't read her her chapter yet. I think that's next month. Uh, okay. Next, yeah, it's this month. This month. Yeah, um, I don't think, unless I'm mistaken, we do have the three editors here in the room. So maybe if you can okay. pick one of the editors. And Viv. Okay, Viv. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Viv Bozalik. Um, I, I live in Cape Town. And um, I was involved um, with Nikki and Tammy in editing this collection, um, which was very exciting for us because we we actually started with um, a webinar, which was supposed to be a face-to-face -face event in Simonstown, um, because there were a number of people who were keen to 
to write and to talk about um, their experiences with the ocean. And um, unfortunately, because of COVID, it became um, a, a, an online webinar, but it was still a wonderful day. I remember it still, it was, I think, in 2019, um, in August. And after that, we started working towards getting the people who had been part of that to engage in writing. And we, I remember also meeting with Karen Maris after a swim at St. James and sort of broaching the subject of whether it would be possible to publish this in, in this book series, which has been wonderful because we were able to do podcasts. And, and I think, you know, it's a really good taster um, an accessible tester for for people who are interested in the chapters. So so thanks for that, and thank you to George for putting it all together. It's great, and the website just looks so lovely. So um, yeah, thanks thanks for um having us here, and also for arranging this webinar series. Okay. So that's Speaking. me. Could you yeah. choose the next person? The yes, next I'll, editor. I'll hand over to um, Tammy. Hi, everybody. Um, I also want to extend gratitude and appreciation to Karen Morris and to George Rowley. I think it's wonderful that you've taken up this reading of the book in this way, but also, Karen, for the, the book series, for being a part of it. It was really lovely to launch it in Helsinki and to be, get a sense of the other titles as well. So I'm currently located um, near the Atlantic Ocean in the southern part of Cape Town in South Africa. I'm not nearly near enough to the ocean right now because I'm desperate for a swim. I haven't had an ocean swim for some days, having been traveling. Um, I, most of my work, I'm, I'm at the University of the Western Cape in Women's and Gender Studies, and most of my work has actually been directed at uh, sexualities, um, ge how gender and other forms of inequality, other binaries intersect to, to shape uh, subjugated experiences and violences. Um, but over the last decade or more, mostly um, also in collaboration with Verve, I've become involved in, in looking at justice in higher education and rethinking what we're doing in the university, rethinking what we're doing in our scholarly praxis and, and how we are inadvertently reproducing the very logics that we're hoping to challenge. And we carry on, in fact, uh, compromising in this respect very often, being in the universities that we live in. Um, Karen talks about the day job. I wouldn't call it a day job. That job takes over our whole lives. It's, it, it populates our dreams or nightmares as well. Um, but I, I have um, more and more been, been um, allowing my wonderful um, relationship with water, well, wonderful and challenging at times, um, to become a part of my, my thinking and my scholarship. It always was, and it's about recognizing how, how powerful this um, you know, bodies of water, thinking with water, engaging with water, reading, writing, thinking together in water, through water, about water, um, can make a difference um, in, term, in ways of doing scholarship, but also in trying to, to make a difference to what we as humans or many humans, are in, all of us are implicated in and responsible for um, the challenges and damages and um, disasters that we, we, we're facing as a result of the way that we have lived and are living um, in relation to other species on the planet. So I'm really happy to see this book having come to fruition. Um, and, and lovely to see so many of the authors and other colleagues and friends here. So that's about me. I'll hand over to Nikki. Oh, as my phone rang. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Tammy. Um, again, also wanting to say thank you to Karen and to George and to Eleanor from Routledge and um, to Sherry and Joanne who were with us when we launched the book 
in Helsinki and how unexpectedly moving it felt to, to launch it up in that very icy, cold, snowy part of the world and recognize how water, I really had that sense of how water is what carries us everything through it and kind of the sense of interconnected flowing being that felt incredibly strong while we were there. So just a little bit about myself is that I come from a visual arts background and um, I came to higher education quite recently as a teacher in art history and design and used my way of working in the studio uh, to inform my practice as teacher and that led me to a PhD exploring ways of, of, of learning and making and, and, and finding different modes of expression in higher education, um, particularly using kind of arts-based methodologies. And I've always swum. And it was working with Viv as my supervisor as a social swimmer in a sense that, that this project grew and where the swimming um, became important for me in the PhD journey was it allowed me an opportunity to, to think, as Tammy was saying earlier, think through swimming um, and engagements, encounters with the water and others who were also approaching the water in similar ways, similar but of course different ways, that my learning really, I really found a way of um, being able to express the learning um, or my, yeah, the knowledges, the knowledges that were being formed through processes that I hadn't really been able to express with words prior to that. So I also want to say thank you to, to Viv and Tammy for, um, for our writing and swimming and reading together, which is another chapter which we might discuss at a further date, but also for mentoring me along this process of, of making this book real. Um, it's been a great learning experience, and um, and I'm very conscious of the webinar or of the colloquia that we held. And in fact, it was in 2020, I think. It was because it was already COVID time, and the sense of 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 all that went into the making of this book, but not in terms of the making of the book simply, but building this community, or at least being part of a community, that that has been such an enriching experience for me personally. Um, I think I'll stop there. I don't know. Do I need to introduce anybody else, or what's no. what's the next? Karen? Unless yeah. someone has no thanks, and I think what um, yeah, it, I mean, what you're saying raises this this question about actually when does a book begin, right? Yeah, <laughs> and and yeah. and yeah, that you can't, and the whole thing about temporality and temporalities there. But I suggest that we could start with our questions and the questions that were sort of collected and raised during the reading group. So just to explain, maybe some people came in later, is that we had a weekly reading group with people who hadn't written uh, the chapter because we otherwise find that people go really from question to answers. And we wanted to make sure that people who were in the room can't just give an answer or felt compelled or felt um, the need to answer so that we were sort of struggling with some of these questions uh, ourselves first. And uh, so uh, George is going to share that. And what I have done is sort of put them into three kind of main questions. But I think it's important that you see all of the questions, but a lot of them were just like, you know, they really wanted to have an answer. And then I just trust that people in the room will will respond to those questions, not only through their answers, but um, through more questions. So if you look in the chat, then um, the yeah, you've or just one message. <laughs> Oh, OK. OK, that's fine. I mean, what I would uh, say, well, I can read them out as well. I think that might be helpful for people who just listen to the recording. So during the first session, the poem and the foreword, the qu two questions were raised by the group. 
what more can watery thinking tell us about research what is it can it sort of bring to the table you know the wateriness and you know tell me when you were talking about you know a lot about the water through the water etc you know what what actually does it bring to the table you know what is kwamata uh that was one question and then in session two which was chapter three and we're really grateful for the editors that the way they've grouped the different um chapters not kind of in a linear way but they've got uh a particular theme to it and what's going to be interesting for us as well organizers is that we don't oh uh, this is the first time it actually goes over three months so we um because the book with so many chapters and so some of the answers or inquiries that are generated will be generated today will also be relevant for the next one and the next one so there's going to be a kind of deepening and a layering of uh, the inquiry as we go along so please come back for the next uh, panels as well. So uh, for the session, for the chapter three, it is what is the feminism doing in hydrofeminism? You know, are there binaries assumed in this calling of the concepts? Does hydrofeminism introduce a binary? What would hydroism make possible? And would it be more generative? So these were, you know, the feminism as maybe setting up the binary between feminism and or the masculine and the feminine, et cetera. Then uh, chapter two uh, generated the questions, how to keep the movement and fluidity in research and writing, you know? So what the film in that chapter does that the words couldn't do for us, you know, we were like <gasps> quite struck by what the film um, enacted and, what is the effect of the language, the world below your feet? And if any of you want some clarification, obviously, about those questions, do ask. <laughs> and hopefully the person who asked it or the people, because a lot of it was just coming out of inquiries. How could the current legal system incorporate ocean strike, stroke water in their ways of seeing evidence? For example, using stories in lieu of other evidence. What about schools? What are considered legitimate ways of making meaning? And then the last session, that was chapter 12, um, methodologically, what would it have meant to include more arts-based material in the inquiry? What else would have, or inquiry, what else would have come into the chapter using other modalities? What were the reasons for conducting the research in this, what we thought quite traditional way? How did you decide whether or not to make the Gogos co-authors? Why use typical qualitative categories like methodology? That's the structure of that chapter, discussion, etc. Why use the term grandmothers in the title, yet Gogos in the chapter? So what I suggest is that we start with the, so maybe the more general first, where and that is the, the first question would be combining some of session one and session, session two, which would be, you know, hydrofeminism. What's the feminism doing there? And combined with what can more watery thinking tell us about research? So one is the feminism side of hydrofeminism and the other is the hydro side of the concept of hydrofeminism would that be helpful and then i suggest that maybe each of the uh, editors and also dylan um could respond to that first and then we can open it up so i we've got three main questions so maybe what we can do for a quarter of an hour each and then move on to the next and then move to the next. And then we've got a quarter of an hour to wrap up. I wouldn't mind um, starting with the hydrofeminism. And I'm sure, you know, the other authors and editors um, have a lot of views about this. But I would just like to give um, some background as to where it comes from. So there's, there was a book, an edited collection written in 2012 
And it, it was about, it was called Undutiful Daughters. And it was really looking at what, what feminisms have been in the past and present and critiquing the whole notion of waves because feminism is often spoken about <laughs> the first, second and third wave. But it was saying that those are, you know, those neat categories don't really work. And this book um, was looking at, you know, what feminisms might be in the future too. So it was, um, the preface is written by Rosie Bradotti. And then their authors like Claire Colebrook, um, there's also Khabiba Badarun, who's a South African in the book. And um, yeah, I can't remember a lot of others, but one of the chapters is about hydrofeminism. And it's the first time that it's spoken about by um, Astrida Neymanis. And she, um, in the chapter, looks at, you know, what the hydro can bring to feminism. So, um, you know, that's her question, not the other way around. And um, she, she really looks at things, well, she first of all looks at feminine écriture and people like Lucy Irigare and Helen Sichu and Trin Minha and how they um, have made reference to the sea and to hydrofeminism. Um, but she says, you know, hydrofeminism isn't just about women's bodies. It's for everyone. And she also um, says that, you know, it, it brings us to notions of transcorporeality, um, of, um, you know, the in-between interaction, material discursive, all the sorts of things that, um, you know, are currently of interest to feminist new materialists, for example. So I just wanted to to give that background of, you know, where the concept comes from. And then it was built, obviously it was built further in her book called Bodies of Water. Um, but really, um, you know, it can be attributed to, to her writing. So that I, I just wanted to, um, you know, start off there. Anyone else? Thanks. Yeah, see maybe respond from the group. Yeah, I can see you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Tell maybe me. I can to what Vivi is saying because, um, I mean, for me, uh, Strida's Nemanis's sort of paper in feminist review of twenty thirteen is also really important, and I think, I mean, it's 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 very clearly we very clearly very clearly and also maybe clearly. Um, locate ourselves in how to feminism in the book. Um, but for me, what's important about that is that she's she's proposing that we reimagine ourselves as a body of water, um, which opens up possibilities in her words for a post-humanist feminism. So I think she's thinking very much with strands of feminisms from the past, like ecofeminism, but also thinking with more current uh, post-humanism and, and feminist new materialism. Um, and I, 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 importantly, I mean, I think she takes up a, a cartographic uh, method, which um, is a tradition within feminist thinking, the notion of a, um, you know, as, as, as um, um, Bray Dotti um, also works with, and she draws a lot on Rosie Bray Dotti's work, uh, the tradition of feminist figurations. So she's thinking with a, a feminist figuration of water. And I think What's, what's so important about that is that not only that it's fluid, but it's about the kind of acknowledgement, um, what she calls a hydrological reading, an alternative logic, because we've been schooled in logics that are Cartesian, that are about separated individuals, that are about um, certain privileged positions, masculinity, whiteness, um, Westernness, uh, notions of civilization and notions of wildness and nature. And, and, and thinking with water allows for a melting away of that set of what we see as patriarchal, capitalist, colonial logics 
um, to, to, to bring in a, a different um, set of logics, I suppose, the hydro, hydro, hydro logics, um, which, which is very much, uh, you know, about deploying that feminist figuration of water, dissolving boundaries, which are inherent in binary thinking. So, so the question says, are we not reproducing binaries? I think precisely what we're trying to do is to um, disrupt and resist and um, shake up um, the kinds of binary thinking that is so endemic to the way we think in the academy, also endemic to many forms of feminisms. But while, um, um, while Viv, um, you know, has said that she's bringing the um, hydro to feminism, I also think that she's bringing the feminism to hydro, because I do think that hydroism is, is not enough. I think we could be thinking with water for proprietarian, or as Ursula Gwynne would put it, or profiteering ways, as many people do. They think with water in ways that procure profit. But bringing a feminist lens is not just about bringing a lens of gender, it's bringing a lens that is about disrupting the binaries that hinge, that are entangled, that, that are not only about masculinity, femininity, male power, but, but about capital power, about the, anthrop the anthrop anthropocentric power, human exceptionalism. Um, so, so uh, you know, I, I, I think it, it is both and um, the bringing of hydro and feminism to to think with and work through through each other, and not only for thinking about um, hydrological damages, but but for for a watery kind of thinking that that disrupts the kind of um, rigidity that that we schooled in. Um, thank you. Yeah. There is a comment yeah, so from. It yeah uh, who who yeah nikki you want to come in but dylan has got yeah. um yeah a comment here can i can i ask him to mm -hmm. to come in here because there's this interesting tension um of by highlighting the feminism then the the how that then disrupts the binaries um anyway dylan would you mind saying a bit more what your comment is and your response <clears throat> yes, yeah, sorry, I have to have my video off because I'm having some technical issues, but I'm trying to fix them. Um, but I uh, know I just loved um, the slip that uh, yeah. um, Tammy made around clearly and queerly and and that uh, something about hydrofeminism and the hydro part and the fluid fluidity of knowledge allows us to access plural ways of seeing and being that are porous. I take that from uh, I. Uh, uh, jo Joanne, who often uses that term, um, but that it also remind me of of, of thinking about hydrofeminism in in the expanding field of queer eco pedagogies and being queering our ways of learning and thinking and making knowledge in the context of our of being embedded in ecosys e e ecologies and other entanglements. Um, yeah, and that we. We can sometimes see clearly, and sometimes we can see que queerly, and I love that that slip, subconscious slip. So there was just a comment on that. Um, okay, if I could, could I just come in and just to, to of course, address this? Nikki? Yeah, 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 yeah. So for me, I'm always struck by how triggering the F word is, and it's a bit for me, it's a bit like veganism as opposed to plant based. Um, food choices or preferences and and I think that's why it is so important that it is in the title because it's the it's the non-normative I think when it's the norm it's invisibilized and what we are trying so hard to do is challenge those logics and practices that are so dominant in all of our lives in our workspaces our workplaces and and it it does worry me it saddens me how 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 easily it can cause a reaction, but nevertheless, it's a very important reaction that that needs to be uh, you know that needs to be made visible. Um, and I think, like Dylan was saying, for me, it's so much around it's it, it it's almost a way of thinking or a way of generating knowledge differently um, that is much more of course fluid and constantly moving and and um and mixing and mingling and and i can't i can't really think of how 
and and also to say, of course, it's political. So to take out the feminism and just call it hydro hydroism or whatever would would really lose lose for me the the heart and the soul of the book. Hmm. Okay. There are uh, Joanne. You've put some comments in. The figuration is. Could you say maybe a little bit more about which figuration you're particularly talking about and how uh, that helps us think about the hydro and hydro feminism or the feminism in hydro feminism? I, I put the comment in there as a response to um, what Tammy was saying um, when she was referring to ways mm. of water and um, working with or being with water. And she mentioned um, Maimonides' Astrid's uh, figuration of bodies of water, and I think it's so crucial in this um, this this inquiry about why hydrofeminism or why posthumanism or why why anyism to to um, diffract through the figurations that that come into being, um, or as that is the entry point as well. You know, if if uh, figurations like working with how Bradotti speaks about figurations as um, dramatizations of processes of becoming, then it looks for me the figurations help to um, to really steer our gaze towards what this is doing rather than what this is or isn't. So what is hydrofeminism doing or what is it or what isn't it? So I just want, that was my, my comment towards, um, I don't know, just uh, responding affirmatively to what um, Tammy included there about the figuration of, of bodies of water, because it's not fixed or, or contra uh, concrete sort of mascot of, of um, either feminism, you know, even in this book, there are different ways in which we are working with water. And it's thinking with oceans, but it's not necessarily that we're all thinking in the same container and then pulling out different threads. Um, so that's why I think figurations are, yeah, was it was affirming what what Tammy was mentioning. Anyone has got any uh, comments? Fifth, you're saying yes, like the lateral line in fishes. Is that in response to Joanne? Yeah, that says it. I suppose it's a figuration that one can use as a sensibility. In well, we wrote a, it. It wasn't in this book, but. Um, Dylan um, maybe could say more about it, but we wrote a chapter on slow science and um, using the lateral line um, of fish where they can sense movement um, through their lateral lines. And yeah, I just sort of feel that, um, and others have written, uh, of course, in the book, which will come later, there's the octopoid aesthetics and I myself have also written about the octopus's figuration um as an ethical figuration for social work. So I think that these are all hugely generative for for thinking differently. And um just um one other thing about the hydrofeminism, I think the, the contribution that this book was supposed to make was that it is a contribution from the global south. So while we're all thinking differently about hydrofeminism, it is a southern contribution, you know, to to this notion that has um arisen and and been made um available to us from Neymanus. I am going to stop you. Is that okay if you can just park this one, Tammy, for now, uh, to move on to the next one? And and it is just completely related. But I think when, uh, just in response to Nikki as well, is that the question of what is the hydro doing in feminism and the feminism doing in hydro? I think when um, you can see that that probably is just very helpful for researchers when they when they work with this concept um, in a generative way. And um, 
And and for example, the critique that Barad has had a lot about, well, why don't you say more explicitly what is the feminism in your agential realism when, you know, when you think about the relationality and the last kind of comment about, you know, the bodies of water and as a figuration and how that also is not just human bodies of water, right? So, and that relationality comes very clearly uh, in already these first chapters that we've read uh, and the disruption of these binaries. Um, so let's move. And I love the way you were talking about figurations, uh, Joanne, about, I'm just, I keep sort of just tasting it. So dramatizations of processes of becoming, right? Very nice. So that's... Um, inspired by Bradotti's use of figurations. So let's uh, have a look at the second one. And actually the second and the third one, again, very uh, closely connected, which is really about methodology. So I think that the, they kept coming uh, back again and again about how, if that is the figuration, if that is the the ism, the hydrofeminism, and um, and the wateriness. How you know the the um, not just the challenge, but the opportunity uh, for us as researchers and as pedagogues. You know how, how to let that um, yeah drip through <laughs> the way we write and um, the way we teach and with the way we do research and maybe, um, yeah, maybe Nikki, you, you were the last one to start to, <laughs> to comment, or I don't want to point it at anyone in particular, but if you would like to comment on that, um, that would be great. I guess anyone wants to come in first. Um, well, I think in particular with your expertise, you know, you probably have a lot to say about that too. Well, <clears throat> what I'm what I'm I'm sitting with is what we were saying earlier about generative approaches, and 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 I I get a little bit stuck on methodologies as fixed, and what I loved about and really value about the process, for example, if I look at what Tammy Viv and I have been working and writing about is how generative our writing, swimming, reading practice has been. And in fact, I have been, I've been involved in other similar kinds of, of, of um, collaborations that have led to newness. And I think particularly working with water or being with water or thinking or swimming with water and um, and what what lives in the water, really, if we if we open ourselves to be led by that, um, new new methodologies continually reveal themselves. It's 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 about for me it was so much about an openness to being, um, and and as we were talking earlier about an attunement to what is happening. Um, that allows an opening towards what knowledge can become and how we might become ourselves, become different um, through those encounters with knowledge. So I always I always hesitate when it with um, what am I trying to get at here? I don't think there's a one size fits all or paint by numbers approach to these kinds of ways of working. It's more as a, as examples of being open again, being open um, that that these kinds of practices can emerge. Thank you. I don't necessarily want to go to uh, other editors first, but maybe Dylan you would like to comment on that. Yeah, I can you hear me? I'm so yeah. worried you guys can't hear me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's see if I can also try a video. Um but um work in um 
is the video making it worse? No. Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> to my face, this fun. Um, but I um, yeah, I think that the one of the major shifts that it's that's for a long time, and even the trans epistemological space, like working in indigenous solidarity work, for example. What I find unique about the hydrofeminist space is that it allows for a sense of informality and conviviality in sense making. And there's it's not just the swimming together that is, but it's it's the effort of going to the ocean and or going to a body of water and people packing food for afterwards. Um in, in Cape Town in particular, the water is very cold. And so there's quite literally warmth work that needs to happen after the swimming. <laughs> and there's a tending to each other's enlivenedness and into mm. each other's uh, bodies and ways of being that are very care-based. And if we think of feminism, one thing that makes it stand out of other modes of research is that it centers care. Uh, I think if we, if we, maybe there's some outliers, but if we think about all feminisms, um, mm they are a premise care and I think from what Viv's saying about the global south approach what the African hydrofeminists are exploring together is is also how does the the care work in relation to the ocean and watery bodies which have um painful history such unjust and cruel memories and as Joanne would say that are haunted um how is the swimming and being together and thinking in this way offering uh, not just kind of this like um, monolithic kind of memorializing of that pain, but actually digesting it and metabolizing it and making meaning with it um, uh, in a very careful way. Um, I think that's really been a big shift for me. I'm I'm part of another larger project, which I won't name here just to protect their, because <laughs> I'm going to be critical now, but uh, which is a transdisciplinary ocean research project uh, across many disciplines. And in many ways, I find care lacking and, and warmth work lacking in the meaning making and in the knowledge work. And, um, but when I've worked in this field, in this space, in this community, I felt nothing but warmth and openness, but still high levels of rigor, uh, not just academic rigor, but political rigor, emotional rigor, spiritual rigor. These other ways of knowing and being and doing in the world are given, given real sovereign space to live out in the research process. So I feel like that for me is a big um, role that hydrofeminism has played in my role as a researcher. And then as a supervisor, um, Viv and I supervise um, another author in the, book, in the book as well. And we've been exploring together, the three of us, around supervision as a form of midwifery or, or more like doula, being a doula. You know, you, you're helping people catch, we're catching babies and catching stories and knowledges. Um, and if we can see midwifery and doulaship as an ancient feminist research space, um, Maybe there's something there that I have only been able to tap into in this hydrofeminist research community or family. So, yeah, maybe I, that's to answer the question of what it's done for me in that space. Um, those are some of the things. Thank you. Maybe other or authors first in the book. Um, I can see Sherry here and maybe... Joanne again before turning to the editors. Don't have to. So how does it really um yeah, how to keep the movement of fluidity in research and writing? And is it real research? I mean, I think that was also a question that's nice to combine with it, which came from chapter three. You know, is it you talk, uh, Dylan, about rigorous um, research, while at the same time, it's I love that phrase, warmth work. Um, so is it possible to be rigorous and do that warmth work um, and full with care? 
So otherwise, maybe I, I sort of cut you short, uh, Tammy, earlier on. Maybe you want to <laughs> respond? Thanks, Karen. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and include that point in my answer here. I mean, I've I've been trying for quite some time because I'm working in a feminist um, community of practice to to think about research that is decolonial, that is um, also post-humanist and um, going beyond, you know, as I mentioned, Cartesian um, um, binaries and divides. And so for me, I think the watery thinking well, firstly, for me, it happened like just by, by doing my own PhD. I, I was always finding, and Viv and I shared this a long time ago, how that when we were stuck with, you know, how, where do I go? How do I make this argument? What is missing here? We'd be swimming. And suddenly it was like these sort of aha moments, like the 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 clarifying and the, the querifying were just happening in the water um, through our kind of in a bodily way. And I think so for me, it is about reimagining research as embodied, as affective as well, as, as relational. And it, it allows us to, to reimagine research also. And I think this is the point I was going to make to add to what we see as how to feminism. It's to allow, to see research as situated, as located, that we are, um, because, Estrida also starts off with Adrian Rich's concept of a politics of location, which we, you know, that's what I was going to bring in, which is, I suppose, very much like um, Harding's notions of situatedness, um, which is about remembering where we are. And Dylan and, and Josie, all of us have been working and thinking with ontology and the way in which in the ocean we are um, aware of the, the hauntings of of colonization which happened through the water we're aware of slavery and and the bodies that died on journeys we're also aware of the hauntings of the future of extinctions of certain you know um aqueous creatures um but also on the shores we're aware of people who were there before us and animals who were there before us and in the book you know the work of um, Adrian um, um, is 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 really and and many of the jo Josie's work, many of, the, of 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 the chapters are about those hauntings, um, and being aware of our location. So it helps us disrupt also disciplinary and other boundaries to work with art and activism in this project of location. And and I think um, you know so much of the work and there is so much work out there that is thinking with art and activist art um, in watery um, oceanic and other bodies of water and beach spaces um, which is also very key to a decolonial feminist project that we're not doing scholarship here and activism here and, and policy here but that we are, are working these things together and then just to say a final word about the relational. Um, I mean, it really is, and I think everybody's alluded to this in different ways, and there isn't anything really more to add than what so we've mostly all said already, but we really do have a sense of our entanglements with all others, um, you know, non-living, living, other species, humans, um, you know, that 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 sense of, I, I look at, I see Barry in the room, and I, I cannot not remember the day I was out in the ocean, and I, I got in trouble, I, I got too cold and I felt, um, and that moment of, of, of care um, and, and being held and asking for help. And, but I mean, that's really just a very human centered example. There are many, many, many others um, about, um, and, and realizing then our responsibility and responsibility um, to get beyond um, our sense of individualized um, um, exceptionist humans, um, yeah. If, if I could also just add to what Tammy's just said, because I've I've been thinking, you know, Dylan's talking about sense making and and something, there's something about being in the water where we are vulnerable, where it is precarious, where it is risky, where all our senses are engaged with keeping us alive and afloat, that the concepts or the ideas that we're thinking and reading about become that much more, make that much more sense. So there's something about the activity of 
whatever it is that we're doing in the water, however it is that we're doing it, why ever it is that we're doing it, that somehow there's a, there's it, yeah, for me, those are aha moments that you're talking about, Tammy. I, I, for myself, would love to understand more what, what it is that is different about being in the water than, say, walking in the forest or, I don't know, whatever, whatever the example could be. But, but it, it, there's, there's something specific, you know, it's, there's a specificity, specificity, a situatedness, all of that, that, that is particular to, to being, I want to say being in the water, but of course it's much more than that. Thank you and welcome Buchle, to the to the space. Um, really nice. I mean, I, it's impossible to summarize what we've been talking about, but one of the questions that we might go straight into is also one that Dylan would like to to meet. It's nice to meet questions, uh, not M E A T, but M E E E T. Meet the question. And it is about what is real research. So you would like to speak to it. But I was wondering whether you could also pick up the other question about how could the current legal system incorporate the ocean, the water in their ways of seeing evidence? So it's this whole thing about what counts as real research, what counts as evidence, uh, using stories in lieu of other evidence and also maybe schools. So, yeah. I mean, I don't want to put all this in your lap, but I thought when well, you want to speak to real research, maybe you <laughs> and Buchle as well, if you would like to to follow on from there at any point, you're very, very welcome to. Uh, thanks for welcoming me into the space. I've just joined for now. I'll just pay attention and respond later. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Um, Thank oh, Karen, so ah, I, there you are. You yeah. broke up slightly at the end, but I got most of that. Um, uh, just stop me at any point if you can't hear me. Um, but uh, yes, I wanted to respond to the question of what is research. I can also come to the watery knowledge and law work as well. But um, uh, and, and I think Bootle could um, come in later around when we answer the question around why we chose a kind of traditional framework for the Gogo chapter, the Grandmothers of the Sea chapter, um, is around this question of what is research. Um, because... Uh, my, my chapter on the when ancestors are included in um, ocean decision making and meaning making was really um, a, a kind of challenge to this question of what counts as research and a challenge to knowledge hierarchies that are part of the colonial hauntology in our university system. Um, this idea that certain knowledges are more important than others and that certain knowledges um, must enter the curriculum, which I talk about in the chapter, but also only these things can be passed as evidence in a courtroom. And I think um, uh, also a lot of the work that Boucher has been doing over the last few years um, with the Coastal Justice Network has been around challenging the ways in which people are being sidelined in which knowledge is counting in the ocean economy master plan, for example, you know, or um, and so does it count as real research? I think our big question is what is real? Um, because so many of the parameters in which we've been taught to consider reality have been ones that are deeply Newtonian, cause and effect, um, that are uh, kind of siloed in, um, in disciplines and uh, around very archaic ideas of property. Um, and I think what was why this felt like the most um, real research I've ever involved was uh, participated in is that I didn't have to uh, compartmentalize myself or, or be a certain identity or put on a kind of mask in order to practice the, the kind of charade of, of academia. I could be a full queer non-binary mermaid with my friends and mm. at the same time be deeply embedded with indigenous solidarity work with the struggles and justices of small scale fishers and Sangomas whose knowledges was not included in in the the case against my chapter looks at really the case against um shell and the oil and gas explorations of our coastline and and there was this clear gap 
where intangible heritage, um, the, the fact that for many South Africans, that the ocean is sacred, that the ocean uh, is the dwelling place of ancestors, and somehow this wasn't in the courtroom and wasn't being discussed. But the lawyers, the incredible lawyers at LRC and Natural Justice, they knew this and they were trying to find creative ways of getting that knowledge into the courtroom. Because, so the real, the real court case that, and I say this in the chapter, that really uh, moved things or the real evidence was the affidavits of the fishers themselves. And if you come to the chapter that Butler and I wrote and Butler led, we were very specific to ensure that the majority of the chapter was written from verbatim from the women's voices and, and their articulation. And all the research was done in vernacular cluster and uh, worked with the only... Oops. So we have no electricity here in Makanda now, it's load shedding. Maybe that's why Dylan is, yeah. No, he's in Johann Johannesburg, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it could still be load bend. shedding. You might have load shedding there too. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Did I, did I break up again? Uh, yeah. You're back. Uh, we lost you. I don't know where I cut it off. No, we heard a lot of what you said. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and actually, it it almost, if that's okay, Viv, I know that you haven't yes. spoken yet to this question, but I think it it is almost sort of drifts, <laughs> not a backwash, uh, drifts into the last question, which is about the chapter with Buchle as well, which here, um, there were quite a few questions about that and about the title of the 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 chapter and grandmothers and, um, yeah, you probably can see those in the chat, but it might be roughly for you harder because I don't know if you can just take that uh, the last questions, George, because people coming sure. in later wouldn't have been able to read that. And there's sort of a, th a, a lot of questions which had to do with the methodology of the chapter 12. Um, so let me just have a look. Which we thoroughly enjoyed reading and and I think we're quite affected by, by the reading of it. And probably because of that provoked lots of questions. Um, so that was uh, chapter 12, Grandmothers of the Sea, Stories and Lessons from Five Ocean Elders. So um, they were in there. So what would it have meant? Karen, Karen could yeah. I maybe help um, Butcher, Butcher catch up catch yeah. up a little bit just because yeah. she arrived late? Um, um, Butcher, I was wondering if you would feel, or not to put you on the spot, but if you would feel comfortable maybe just sharing when we wrote this chapter, you were also wrapping up your PhD in environmental science and the kind of how we played with this chapter as a way of playing at the, of, of how you were trained as an environmental scientist to, to lay out research with like case study methodology and, you know, data and how we turned that on its head by still using that, but yeah, foregrounding the woman. I don't know if you want to just speak about that and what where you were at at the time. Yes, uh, doing the solidarity <laughs> work. Yeah. So, 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 uh, like Dylan has said, coming from here where I did my PhD, and I'm mostly even looking the way I did back where I came from, where you are uh, when you're doing your research is laid in a certain way where you are. Uh, you do everything in the office, you plan, I'm going to collect the data this way, that way, going to do some experimental fields, maybe lab work, do it this way, this way. So when I moved across to environmental, environmental learning research center and to work with the team there, it was a new world of uh, opening eyes to me and whereby now my research really had to transform if I compare my research then and my research now, the, the 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 research I did previously, it would really silence the very people that I'm trying to present. But if you look at my work now, the way it has transformed, it sort of like now gives the voice 
to the people, to the people that I'm working with. It it gives it, it doesn't alter anything. It doesn't. It really leaves, gives the true um, things as they happened in the fields, and the most of them is people with no platform to air their voice. People with um, who have so much knowledge. People who are accustomed of the ocean, but they do not have platform they do not have a say when it comes to the government um platforms where they are supposed to make decisions decisions are made and those decisions that are made they usually affect them like what we see with these grandmothers who all their lives lived within the these coastal communities within the ocean and they have so much so much knowledge about the ocean but no one realizes them no one consults them no one um even think of them when they're making critical decisions that affect them on their day to day. And because of that, I felt that um, since I had that opportunity, maybe it was a good thing to make sure that we give space, we give the voice to them. And I'm socially glad that it has came out the way it has. And also, I was also able in December to go and share it with the broader uh, audiences when I went to the Barbican in London, it was well received and it raised lots and provoked lots and lots of questions. So um, the research that we I'm doing now and I'm involved in and which I love so much, I, I'm enjoying it so much. It's, it's really that kind of research which is actually, I don't want to, to use the word like action research, it's the research which is more about what other people say. My voice is quite there but it's, it's a bit silent because i'm actually giving other people space to air their views and people that are very important to me people that have so much knowledge like the grandmothers and why the name grandmothers is because it's who they see themselves as within their communities they are firstly elder and when you look at an elder person it means it's the person who has lived lived the longest within their community and also when it comes to knowledge they are very much knowledgeable they can actually give you the timelines of things that happen for so many decades. And they are able, again, to tell about the transformations which have taken place within their communities and most of them which are actually affecting them. Things like MPS that are coming into the oceans, which come and most, in most cases come without them being consulted. Things like OMs which are being rolled by the government and they were never consulted. Things, the whole thing like MSPs, which, which are being produced and they've never been part of that processes. So, yeah, so yeah, I don't know if I've really articulated this so well, but I would like to stop here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm following on from that. I think what um, definitely was mentioned in the reading group is the power of the stories and also almost materially the length of the stories that uh, were there and then the question emerged so you know would it have been an idea maybe to make them co-authors or um, mm. you know with that was one of the question raised um, do you have okay. any ideas or feelings or was it at all discussed or yes um so when i we discussed this with them when we were doing the whole ethics thing around this paper when they were really telling us that they want this work out there when i suggested that they were like look um we don't think you will we we trust you. So it was about more like trust and honest and yeah, citing other challenges which they had. Though I was we were happy to make them co-authors and make them lead. But at that time, what we thought of was okay, the next because this part, because of the the numbers of the publication, we had to, to cut a lot of other section mm. of the of the paper. Then we thought maybe in the section in the coming section, that's when we really would maybe co-author with them. Yes. Mm. But I think your the context that you are sketching is a is such a, a real one for a lot of people that you are within an academic context of you know where your research was based and also you know flipping some of that and how how successful that was and there's some 
comments about that in the chat also by George <laughs> who read the, <laughs> the chapter and how beautiful it was um mm -hmm. any anyone else would like to respond to that the chapter 12 and the questions that it generated uh, I suggest now looking at time as well to open it up to to other people rather than the panel and the editors so if you feel that especially quite a few people who were in those reading groups are here and they are their questions and how how do you you know where are you does it generate more questions um excitement Do you need a minute of thinking time? So Dylan is writing in the chat. I think an important part of chapter 12 was ensure because our grandmothers could also speak to their own forms of hydrofeminist meaning making. Oh. Though they wouldn't call it as such, we wanted to ensure they could claim space is feminist research. what I really liked about this chapter and the book as a whole um, but it really started to come through for me in the in the last one is that when I've read things about hydrofeminism in the past I've had this like <laughs> explosive feeling of like this is so beautiful and this is so important but like what does that mean <laughs> and just having these very sort of real I guess examples has just been very for me very meaningful in starting to understand really well what hydrofeminism means I guess also because the South African context is familiar to me as well it's just like yeah so impactful and beautiful not a question but <laughs> mm, comment and how interesting it, it was to actually have to argue, and the editors are familiar with this, that I had to argue my case with Routledge as a book with only South African <laughs> researchers, deserves to be in an international book series when edited books with only, uh, you know, authors from England or the States wouldn't ask the, you know, wouldn't generate that kind of concern, which is, Anyway, we fought that battle, otherwise the book wouldn't have been here. But it's quite extraordinary that it still is happening, you know, in 2023 or whatever it was when we put this forward. Um, thank you. That's very... Really... Um, anyone? Any comments? Fifth, you haven't responded for a while. Any kind yeah. of thoughts, questions? I had a, a, a few thoughts. The, the one was um, about the real research. And I remember when I, I started teaching, which was ages and ages ago at UWC, looking, uh, I had to teach social work students research methodology and looking for texts which might be interesting because the, the prescribed textbook I had been supervising these students was a sort of one that had been around for 20 years, was in its 20th edition, based on positivist ideas of trying to do science in social science. And the, the texts that I found that were very interesting, and that was in the 1970s and 1980s, um, I started teaching, I think, in 1990, um, were feminist texts, and they were also um, participatory research texts, which were mainly from South America and from other countries in Africa. 
but I remember the students having a quite a um, a negative reaction to the fact that they were feminist texts and having to downplay because the thing is that you know feminists and participatory researchers mm. were the ones that were challenging the research canon and were saying when we do research we actually need to have a relationship with people one needs you know this this whole notion of anonymity or distance so things like um you know what is ontology what is epistemology all these things were coming through in feminist texts and um obviously the social work fraternity wouldn't regard that as real research just as now i'm sure that many people would hardly regard post qualitative research as real research and this is evident you know in in especially in south africa in um you know um proposals that go through committees they want to see think you know they want specific formulas and I used to say to my students, okay, just play the game. And then, you know, once you get out of there, we can do what we want to do. But it's becoming more and more difficult to do that. Because um, even if you change your title from when you start, you have to apply to the Senate. And for me, this is just, you know, an indication of how little is understood about research. How can you possibly know before you start your research, what your title will be and how will it be the same title when you finish your research? So, um, you know, I think things are actually becoming more and more rigid and it's it's more difficult. Maybe in other countries it's, it's different, but, you know, I'd be interested to hear. So that's just a rant about you know, <laughs> what is real research. Yeah, and someone was the other day saying it's in the States, it's even qualitative research is like still, mm. you know, is that real research? Um, let alone post -qual. There's a There's a question, um, uh, Karen, Finn, um, um, maybe you could just say it because I think it's such an important question and you've been such a... Um, member of the re of the reading group and been so interested in the chapters we've been reading um so much i i'm just interested because i'm it's so inspiring to hear of people who are so working with ocean and and living with ocean or earth and that that's where i, I would love my research to be and yet I doubt that that's possible for me as a white person living in a Western post-industrial society. Really, like I was brought up in a housing estate where we didn't do much with earth or with ocean. And it's such a new thing for me. And I, so I feel a bit of an imposter. And then I hear of Gogos who, you know, struggled to keep that relationship going, but it was so deep within them. So... I do, I'm, I'm not sure if it's a question or if it's just an observation. Um, but yes, if anyone's got any insight as to how that, that can begin, then I would I would really appreciate that. Dylan is immediately responding. <laughs> so I think we should give him <laughs> the floor. Uh, sorry, I feel like I'm taking... No, it's fine. It's perfectly fine. Your yeah, panel I just wanted well. to... <laughs> I just wanted to thank you so much for that question. I think the research is in that yearning. And, you know, I, I thought about Njaro Kulundu, my colleague, who talks about, she always tells our postgrads, uh, what is research worthy of your longing? And and that question, there's such longing in that, research, in that just that question and a yearning, and also something that's kind of beckoning you. Um, and and I think the research begins with you trying to find ways of researching with and fumbling and maybe clumsily doing so. Um, I think if it's if it's premised with a, a um, with an ethic of care and 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 trying to find ways of kind of developing new organs of perception with the earth, like um, there's some 
fantastic researchers who have become badgers and become, um, there's a beautiful book called uh, Becoming Beast. Uh, with, uh, a, there was one man, I don't know if you know about him, he's in the UK, who, who lived with his son for two years as a badger. They blindfolded themselves and they, they dug um, burrows and they ate worms. <laughs> they became badgers. And there's another man who developed these augmented legs so he could walk like a goat. And he lived with a herd of um, goats in the Alps for, for a season, I think. Um, but I think there's, there's, I think just trying to find a way to come to answer that question will be in itself a massive research process. And um, considering your own positionality, um, there's definitely a way. I, I'd be very curious and excited and would love to, to stay with that question with you because um, I think the more we try to find that uh, way of working with the ocean or with the, the earth or, or even with each other is probably the kind of research we need, um, especially in times of crisis. So, yeah, just to say um, I hear the trepidation in that question, but I think it's the kind of question that feels like a deeply counter-feminist mm. question and yearning. Um, yeah, very excited by it. Yeah, working with your so, yearnings and passions, Tammy is saying. I love the way you were saying that new, or is it new organs of perception? Yes. Wow. Oh, sorry, that's, a, <laughs> that's, that's, I steal that actually from an old dead white man called Goethe. <laughs> um, it's from Goethe, I'm sorry to say, but um, it is very useful. But I, I drew also warmth where it comes from Joseph Boyce, the artist who worked with Goethean observation. But, um, but I'm kind of playing with that and querying it a lot. And, and with Viv and Anya and the, the paper on the lateral line and developing new organs of perception is one of the questions. Like, how could we develop a lateral line like fishes have, which is Wow. Okay. Very quickly then, Tammy, because then we have to draw to a close. It's also in relation to what Finn's raising, which I think is another point that I think we need to constantly bear in mind. And I think that's what a student in Emanus's preface or forward, I can't remember yeah. what we called it, we vacillated, um, was alerting us to is that we also are differently situated in relation to bodies of water. And that while we talk about a unitary sense of hydro commons and our interconnections, we we need to be always vigilant about remembering our different situatedness and um, yeah, and, and what that means and what we may think and what we may do and what is possible and responsible. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all really for coming. And I think also this last question and really raises um, yeah, the importance of continuing with this book and thinking more and thinking with and thinking together. And so I hope you can come to the next one and also uh, with the reading groups, just to, there was some misunderstanding that if you, uh, only the authors of that particular chapter, it would be maybe you know, uh, inhibiting people that are actually in the reading group who just want to genuinely really unpack and get their teeth and their hands and their whole bodies of water into the, the chapter. Um, but everybody else is very welcome. And um, then in the, so this is the overview. Thank you uh, for sharing this. So we've got two more kind of sessions. And so we've got uh, next week, um, you can hear session five, six, seven, so that these different chapters. And then if you're not a member of the reading group yet, please send an email to uh, George, who sent her email in or their email in the chat, but maybe wants to repeat it now. And then in the on the 16th of April, we've got the second panel with Tammy, Nikki, Viv, and then Anya, Cyan, Delphi, and Mare uh, Roberts. Really looking forward to that. And then the month after that, uh, we've got um, more. And then I think we finish at the end of May, aren't we? Yeah, with, it, with the panel three. 
So um, have a great evening or day. George, you want to come in? Oh, my word. Oh, I mean, uh, four, four, panels. four panels. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't even know. What have I committed myself to? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we end uh, mid-June that's right and then we have our uh, summer winter break wherever you are in this world okay so have a good evening day maybe some people have breakfast now and others are just going to maybe have a dip in the sea um, <laughs> thank, you. thank you all for um, wonderful inquiry thank you thank you so much Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, Thank everyone. You. Bye. bye bye. Take Thank care. You. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Ah, Dylan said the next um, the next.